so today, whenever the projector heats up, um, I'm going to continue talking about um, the problem of antibody diversity that we uh, started talking about last time. So I want to give you um, some, that's a scary projector noise. Um, I'm going to give you some general info um, about this process, and then we're going to get into some of the details. Uh, also, thank you for turning in your second inquisitive assignments, um, the ones that were due on Monday. Um, all of the grades are updated on Moodle. Um, so I introduce this problem of the fact that we make about 10 to the 16th different antibody proteins, yet our genome only has 2.3 times 10 to the fourth genes. And I told you uh, that there are two solutions to this problem. One, the uh, issue of combinatorial diversity, the other junctional diversity. And we were talking about combinatorial diversity last time. Um, we noted how um, we've got pairing of different heavy chains and light chains helping us to address this problem, um, as well as the use of different mini genes, the VD and J mini genes, um, to help us address this problem. There's also uh, junctional diversity that we will see uh, a little bit more of today. So this is just sort of um, an overview of that VDJ process that we talked about where um, in the germline, so in the general genome of all cells, there are these small mini gene segments. Um, here you see two different Vs, two different Js. As B cells are developing, they choose one V, one J in this case, and put them together. So you can see four different B cells that have chosen uh, different Vs and different Js to pair together. Um, that actually happens by cutting and pasting the DNA um, in that individual B cell so that the DNA looks different in that individual B cell compared to what it looked like in the rest of the cells. Um, and so now each of those B cells will have its own unique receptor that can bind to um, its own unique antigen. Um, and so we talked about how we have these little mini gene segments. Um, in the case of heavy chain, they are the V segment, the D segment, and the J segment. Um, they encode different amino acids as part of the variable chain of the heavy chain of the antibody. Um, so we're going to pick one V, one D, and one J um, to make a heavy chain gene, um, which will be paired in front of um, the genetic material for the constant region. For the light chain, we're going to do this process again. We're going to be putting together a V segment and a J segment. Um, this is on a different chromosome. We're making here, the variable region of um, the light chain. Um, and this will be paired with um, some genetic information for the constant region. And if you recall, we spent some time doing the math on this last time to see how these you know, smaller numbers of mini genes, like 100-ish, can give us over a million combinations of antibodies. Um, so we looked at the heavy chain, and here you can see the heavy chain V options. We've got 40 of them. The D options, 23. The J options. And then we've got all the genetic information for the constant region. Um, we can also see um, that there are two different light chain uh, areas on two different chromosomes that uh, encode the light chains Vs and Js. Um, I also pointed out that um, the fact that we are actually cutting the DNA 
and removing the intervening sequence is important. Um, so in the germline DNA, in those, in all of your other cells that have this DNA, that have not done the cutting and pasting, the first V is really, really, really far away from this constant region information. There's 40 Vs and all this stuff in between. And that's so far that we can't really have interactions between DNA elements, like this promoter that you can see in front of the V region and this enhancer that is downstream of the C. They're just too far away. They can never interact. And so you will never get transcription at this part of the genome. However, when we actually cut out all the DNA in the middle and put these segments of DNA together, now the promoter is much closer to that enhancer. We can actually start to get interactions and we can get transcription at this locus. Um, so this is one thing that really allows us to get transcription here. And so this is the kind of general overview of how um, some of this works. Um, I've asked students a que some questions about this. Um, and you'll see on the problem set that's due after break, there's a question that sort of relates to some of this. So I want to make sure it's really clear. I thought by asking the question a certain way, I was going to like help make things clear for people. And it said it made things a lot less clear. So we're going to make sure <laughs> it's clear here. So normally in the DNA, um, we've got all of our Vs, all of our Ds, all of our Js. This is in a B cell before it develops, is in every other cell of your body too. Um, and then we've got a bunch of constant region stuff. Um, so a lot of times when I think about this, I think about my V region. So here's a V region. I think about a D region. This is why it's great to be in this classroom with a really long chalkboard. I have a J. They're on this same piece of DNA. And then I've got my constant region stuff. And there's a lot of constant region stuff. And it includes part that will give me an IgM constant region if I wanted to use an IgM constant region. It includes part that will give me IgD if I want to make IgD. It includes part that will make IgG if I want to make IgG. It includes part that will make IgE if I want to make IgE. It includes parts that will help me make IgA. So this is a huge piece of DNA with all of these different pieces of information. If you recall, when I introduced the different isotypes of antibodies, I told you my favorite mnemonic I used to help me remember them, which is MDs give everyone apples. Not only does that help me remember what the five of them are, but it also helps me remember this order. MDs give everyone apples. Um, because that is the order of the constant region of genetic information. So the first thing that will happen is that we'll actually do the rearrangement of the DNA. So you can actually see that we put D and J together, cutting out the intervening sequence. And we pick a V, put the V together, cutting out the intervening sequence. Um, notice that when we do that, like when we first put together this D and this J, we get rid of the intervening DNA, but everything else on the outside stays totally the same and is not touched. 
Then we're going to cut out this bit of intervening DNA, but everything on the outside is going to remain untouched. So first, we're going to make these changes to the DNA. Then we're going to actually um, make our um, mRNA. We're going to transcribe that mRNA. And originally, the mRNA is going to look pretty much the same as the, um, the DNA that we have. By the end, the mRNA that we're going to use is just going to have the constant region information that we need. Um, so we're going to have kind of spliced to use the appropriate constant region. So um, at the beginning, my DNA might look like this. Um, at the end, I'm, I'm not going to draw the DNA right now. Um, the, the, I'm not going to draw the rearranged DNA right now for reasons, because I'm going to draw it later. Um, but eventually, the RNA is going to be the V. It's going to be touching the, J, the D. It's going to be touching the J. There's going to be a little bit of space. There's going to be the IgM constant region. And we're not even going to have the rest of the business that we had. We're just basically going to do some splicing, just have the part that we need. And that will encode here, you can see the heavy chain protein. This same process is going to happen again in that B cell, but at the another chromosome where the light chain is encoded. And so we're going to see this whole process happen once for the heavy chain in our B cell as it develops, um, putting together the V, D, and J and the heavy chain stuff, as well as happening for the light chain with the V and the J and the constant region. So you can see kind of how um, all of these gene segments, A, the fact that we've got two different sets of this rearrangement happening, and how the gene segments correspond to the antibody protein that we have already seen. Um, so when we talked about the antibody and its structure, um, we talked specifically about one part of the antibody structure being really, really, really important for binding to antigen. And the goal here, of course, is to get a unique protein that binds to you a unique antigen. If you remember, we talked about the immunoglobulin-like domains with some beta sheets and some little loops. And I told you at the very end of the variable regions of the antibody, there are three little loops, three on the heavy chain, three on the light chain. You can see the three little loops here. And those three little loops are coming off the end of the heavy chain and the light chain and actually are touching the antigen, um, which you can see nicely in this slide. Here's an immunoglobulin domain with the loops. And of course, those are the most variable parts of the variable region, so they are the hypervariable region. They are also the things that determine um, which antigen this cell is complementary to, so we sometimes call them the complementarity determining regions. So we can think about, well, wh how exactly do the complementarity determining regions map onto this whole business that I'm telling you about with BDJ? Um, when we actually look at our V's, D's, J's, and constant regions and try to say, where do the amino acids that make up those little loops, those complementarity determining regions, where do they come from? We find that CDR1, or the first loop, is just a part of the variable region that we picked. CDR2 is just a part of the V that we picked as well. So CDR1 and CDR2 are basically just based on which V we picked. But CDR3 is actually encoded by the junction of the V, D, and J. So CDR3 is going to be super unique because that's the, you know, 
any B cell that chooses V number, fifth, number 27 is going to have the same CDR1 and CDR2, because V27 just always has those as part of its structure. But even if you pick V27, you're going to be combining it with a different D and a different J, and you're going to get some super unique just to that B cell CDR3. Um, and you can see CDR1 and 2 of a light chain are also encoded by the V region of the light chain, while the CDR3 is encoded by the junction of the V and the J. Um, so this VDJ recombination in particular is giving us a super unique CDR3, or third one of those little loops, that is going to be able to contact antigen and make a super unique um, aspect of this antigen. So last time, ooh, okay. um, last time we did some math, and we talked about how many V's, and how many D's, and how many J's, and how many heavy chains, and how many light chains. And we came up with, you know, like I said, about 100 mini gene segments gave us a million antibodies, or 10 to the 6 antibodies. Pretty awesome. But when we go to our problem that we had, I didn't say that we needed to make 10 to the 6 antibodies. I said we needed to make 10 to the 16th antibodies. <laughs> so this combining the V, D, and J, and just having some different Vs, some different Ds, and some different Js, doesn't get us all the way there to solving the problem. The other part of solving the problem, which you could have seen from that early slide I had, is this thing called junctional diversity. All junctional diversity means is that when we cut and paste our DNA, we're not completely precise about it. Sometimes we add or subtract base pairs. Um, so what this is showing is here is a V. It's V kappa 21. Here is a J, J kappa 1. So this B cell has picked V kappa 21, J kappa 1 in making its light chain. And the V is in pink and the J is in yellow. This is what the sequence looks like in the original cell that we're going to cut and paste together. When different B cells do that choice and will cut and, and cut and paste those two together, Sometimes they lose some base pairs, and sometimes they add some base pairs. And so here you can see four different B cells who all picked VK21, J kappa 1, but they all gained or lost base pairs a little bit differently. And so we can get four totally different receptors just from even picking those same uh, segments. Um, so you can see kind of which base pairs came from the pink, which base pairs came from the green, and the addition or loss of some additional base pairs. Um, so this is what we mean by junctional diversity, in that when we're actually doing the cutting and pasting, sometimes we add or subtract some base pairs, and that buys us even more diversity on top of the diversity we already have. Um, so this kind of shows you um, a version of this math, um, you know, we, if we actually look at these, these J's, heavy chains plus light chains, but then we add on all the adding and subtracting base pairs, that gets us to, yes, this slide says 10 to the 13 instead of 10 to the 16. The answer is it's a big number. We don't have to worry about whether it's 10 to the 13 or 10 to the 16. The answer is it's a really big number, and junctional diversity gets us there. Um, by being sort of, I kind of think of it as like, adding the sprinkles on top of the VDJ <laughs> diversity that we've already added. Um, so in trying to um, get uh, the slides together for today and work through things, um, I had to take out some stuff I was going to tell you last time. It'll go in another place. But I have to introduce you to a little bit of a problem. And 
I want you to think for a second about Bio 250 and Dr. Dunaway as we think about what is um, going on with BDJ recombination. So I'm going to remind you about a general definition of VDJ recombination. And I want you to think about what Dr. Dunaway in Bio 250 would say as I tell you this. So with VDG recombination, all of your developing B cells cut, aka break, and paste their DNA multiple times to make the antibody gene. A a any, what is, what is Dr. Dunaway going to say about that? Yeah, Jay. He, he, he's like, it's, you, he might say it's bad for the DNA. Jay worries about us losing the DNA, and we do lose some information. Um, Dr. Dunaway's gonna say, it's bad, gonna say it's this bad. Dr. Dunaway's going to be very concerned at this moment. Why is he very concerned? What's the big concern when thinking about VDJ recombination at this point? Did, what did Dr. Dunaway ever say to you about things like if DNA breaks? What happens if DNA breaks, according to Dr. Dunaway? Yeah, come here. He talks about the cell dies. He, I remember he would spend a lot of time talking about how you get dead. Yeah, that was if anything bad happens to your DNA, right? Now, I just told you that every developing B cell in your body broke and pasted its DNA multiple times. Hopefully, you see this like, disconnect here. <laughs> and in fact, this is a huge problem with VDJ recombination. You have probably heard of many types of leukemias and lymphomas. Leukemias and lymphomas are cancers of different types of white blood cells, sometimes of leukocytes and sometimes of lymphocytes. The, and if you actually did, ranked all the tissues in the body in terms of how frequently we saw cancers, you would get skin up at the top. And you'd be like, well, yeah, because skin is like in contact with the sun. And we can imagine it getting damaged. And if you started ranking tissues, most of the tissues who, that would rank really high are ones that are in contact with the outside world that you can imagine get damaged really easily. But one that ranks really high, even way higher than it should be expected, are cells of the immune system, leading to things like leukemias and lymphomas. And that's because sometimes VDJ recombination goes wrong. So this figure. Um, on the left is actually naming a bunch of types of leukemias and lymphomas. All of them are situations where B cells did VDJ recomb messed up their VDJ recombination. The difference is sort of where the B cell got messed up in its life that distinguishes these different types of leukemias and lymphomas. But VDJ recombination is super dangerous. Um, this is something called the Philadelphia chromosome. It's found in chronic myel uh, myelogenous leukemia, or CML. Um, what happens in CML is that we're tr we try to do uh, BDJ recombination on chromosome 22 to make some heavy chain, cut the DNA, and then in the patient, the DNA gets pasted back to the wrong place. It actually pastes onto the wrong chromosome. So you can see that part of the orange chromosome gets pasted onto blue because VDJ recombination messes up. And this is actually what causes the tumor in these patients. Um, and these mixed chromosomes, those mixed chromosomes called the Philadelphia chromosome. So what I want you to realize is that, yeah, VDJ is amazing because it allows us to solve this diversity problem. But it's also crazy dangerous. And in some ways, you look at it and you're like, this is the most insane thing 
anyone is ever telling us, we're going to break our DNA a bunch of times. What? And so this sort of gets at the fact that this process of VDJ recombination has to have a lot of regulations. It has to have a lot of steps. It has to have a lot of rules. Because if it goes wrong, it goes wrong bad. <laughs> you are, we are doing something incredibly dangerous with the genome. Um, and so we're going to spend the rest of our time today kind of going into some more nitty gritty details in terms of VDJ recombination. We're going to be seeing kind of very specific events of how this works. That's why I didn't draw some stuff, because I'm going to add more things to my drawing. Um, and we're going to be learning about a number of different proteins that are going to be really important. So you can see some of those proteins here. Um, again, I have this here partially for your reference. Um, we're going to see some proteins called Reg1 and Reg2. We're going to see a protein called TDT. Um, things that are really important to note about Reg1 and Reg2 in particular is that Reg1 and Reg2 is only in lymphoid cells. It's only in B cells and T cells. And we'll see more about that going forward. But basically, one of the ways that we regulate this process is we make sure that one of the enzymes for the cutting and pasting is only in the cells that should be cutting and pasting. We don't want a random skin cell making the cutting and pasting enzymes, because that could be dangerous. That skin cell could mess up its DNA. Um, TDT is also lymphoid specific. That's less uh, super important. There are other proteins that are not really specific to lymphoid cells. They're really just all DNA repair proteins. Um, we're, I will talk a little bit vaguely about things like Ku and DNA-PK. I'll talk a little bit about sort of ligase polymerase. I'm not going to care which ligase and polymerase. All of those things I'm going to mention a little bit. Um, I am going to mention Artemis um, more specifically and talk more specifically about Artemis. Um, another thing that I want to mention that comes up on this slide which you can see in a few different places here, um, particularly up here with Reg1 and Reg2, there are patients who are missing the genes that encode these proteins, and so they don't make these proteins. Um, if you are missing particularly Reg1 and Reg2, which are like the star enzymes we're going to see today, you cannot make B cells or T cells. You end up with no adaptive immune system, um, or this disease called SCID, severe combined immunodeficiency. Um, we now have a pretty good way of treating it. Um, before we treated it, um, it was largely found in boys because some of the genes that are involved are on the X chromosome. Um, and those boys did not make it past the age of 20. Um, most of them uh, died really before 10, in fact. Um, because this is such an important process of giving you this adaptive immune diversity. So if you can't, if you don't have these proteins we're going to talk about, no adaptive immune response. But if these proteins mess up, cancer. So we got some big danger either way with these proteins. All right, so we're going to be going through VDJ recombination in uh, some more detail. So let's imagine that I put a bunch of string or something in front of you. I said, here's the genome. Do some VDJ recombination on the genome. Go. What kind of things would you actually need in order to do that besides just a pile of string? What kinds of things would you actually need to make this work? Because the cell has a genome, going to do VDJ recombination and try not to mess it up. What's the cell need? You're going to need something to cut it, right? So you're going to need an enzyme that's going to do some cutting. OK, what else are you going to need? Yeah? Um, you need recombinase? So uh, recombinase is often, we can think of as the thing that's doing the cutting. Um, so yes, 
um, an enzyme that's going to allow for re uh, recombination. Usually we think about and the enzyme doing the cutting being the recombinase. OK? What else are you going to need? Yeah, Michael. You're going to need something to fit to like paste the DNA back together, right? Make sense? OK, you need those two things. There's one other thing you need. And this is the thing people forget. Um, and it's actually the first thing I want to talk about, so that's why we kind of have to do it this way. So what else are you going to need if I just give you this pile of genome and say, cut and paste the genome, please. Here you go. Yeah. Um, not exactly. Yeah. So, so both of those things are important, but they're not sort of the one key thing. You want to make sure you don't mess this up. Yeah. Yeah, you need something to say, this is the part you should cut. This other part is an important gene that you should not cut. You need like a label. <laughs> that says, this is where the V is. <laughs> Don't cut some other place. Cut here, <laughs> right? If I just gave you a pile of string, you would need to know where on the string to cut. <laughs> and so that's the first thing we're going to think about. This is DNA that we are cutting and pasting. So really, our only option for a label <laughs> is a specific sequence. <laughs> so all of our mini gene segments that we are going to recombine have specific label sequences next to them. They are known as recombination signal sequences, or RSSs. There are two different kinds of RSSs shown here. One kind has something known as a heptamer, which is this conserved seven base pairs of C, A, C, A, G, T, G. Then there's a spacer of 23 base pairs, and they can be any 23. Then there's a nonomer, um, A, C, A, 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 C, C. So you can see, um, we usually will refer to this whole thing, the heptamer, the spacer, and the nonomer, together as the 23 base pair RSS. We also will have another type, has the exact same heptamer, has the exact same nonomer. But instead of having a 23 base pair spacer, it has a 12 base pair spacer. And so again, that could be any uh, number of um, any base pairs, just the number is what's really important. Um, in fact, what we realize is that 12 base pairs is basically once around the helix, which means that the heptamer and the nonomer are next to each other and an enzyme can grab them. And 23 is twice around. So in fact, I once learned these as two turn, two turn RSSs and one turn RSS. Um, I'm going to refer to them as 12 and 23. You can see in this figure from this textbook, they're drawn as triangles. And they're drawn as two different colored triangles. So all of my gene segments should have recombination signal sequences. So I'm going to give you a few gene segments here. So I got three Vs. I got three Ds. And I've got three J's. And I'm almost tall enough to do this. All right, so this is my new gene, this is my new chromosome that we're gonna be rearranging. And I'm missing some RSSs. The V's are gonna have RSSs that are immediately next to them. So you can see right after the end of the V, we start the sequence for the RSS. Um, and it's going to be on the side that we want to bind stuff to. So like, we're going to put a D eventually on this side of the V. And I got a, one over here, and one over here, one over here for my J's, one over here for my J's, one over here for my J's. And my D's have to bind to both a V and a J. Well, my D's. 
It looks like that. They have one on either side. So these are the things that are going to tell my cutting and pasting enzymes that this is a place to be cutting. But you will notice that this figure shows that there are two different kinds, the 23 base pair kind and the 12 base pair kind. And there is a rule about them. It is called the 1223 rule. This is a figure from your textbook depicting the 1223 rule. Um, your textbook doesn't always draw these as triangles. So here you can see we've got the 7239 that I'm depicting up there as a triangle, or the 7129. You can see the same thing. Um, I'm going to go back to this view from this other textbook, um, also for the 1223 rule. Sections that are going to combine with each other have to have opposite types of RSSs. So if we look at this heavy chain shown here, the Vs have the 23 kind. The Ds have the 12 kind on either side, and the Js have the 23 kind. Um, I usually depict them as either solid or like filled or open, as you can see here, to show that there are two different kinds, because it's really important with RSSs that we know that there are two different kinds. You can only put together a 12 and a 23. You will notice on the light chain that one kind of light chain has the 12 on the Vs and the 23s on the Js. The other one has it the other way around. I actually don't care that you know which one's 12 and which one's 23. I care that you know that there's two kinds and you can tell me something like this. There's two kinds, filled is one kind, empty is one kind. And in the case of this heavy chain, the antibody heavy chain, that you know that one kind is on the V's and on the J's, and the other kind is on the D's on both sides. So that's what you should be paying attention to here. And so what you can notice is that in the case of our heavy chain, you can't put a D next to another D. You can't join them together because the RSSs don't match. You can't join this to this because the RSSs are not compatible. You have to have two mixed ones. But you could put a D with a J because their RSSs will work. You can't put a V with a J and skip over the D. The RSSs don't work. You have to be able to put V, D, and J together. Do you have a question, Jameer? All right. Um, and so you can see this same kind of idea here as well. So this is showing a light chain. We've got our Vs with one kind of RSS, our Js with another kind of RSS here. And you can see that the RSSs start like immediately next to the um, mini gene segment that we're going to combine. There's not like space in between them. Um, and what will happen is we'll pick one V and we'll pick one J. We'll cut out the intervening DNA. And when we do that cut, we cut right between the RSS and the gene segment. And we eventually make the gene segments be next to each other, and we get rid of the intervening DNA. But the outside DNA stays the same. So if I were to pick V2, oops, V2, uh, D2, and 
j1, eventually I'd get the v, the d, and the j next to each other. I would have cut off the RSS, and I would have put the gene segments right next to each other. But the other parts of the DNA would look exactly the same. See, I'm not going to rewrite the same constant region from above. I'm going to say it's the same as from above, because <laughs> I got lazy. Um, and so you can see this happening both here for a, a VJ on a light chain. Here you can see a heavy chain. Um, as we will la later see, it goes in an order. So D and J come together first, then the V goes to the DJ. But you can see kind of this process and what it will eventually look like. And so notice that um, the final DNA and the RNA are a little bit different. We spliced out all that extra business in the RNA. But in the final DNA, it was still there. OK, so we can now actually start to think about um, the enzymes that are doing the cutting. Now we know where they're going to cut and what it's going to look like with the cutting. But now we need some enzymes who are going to do the cutting. Um, and the enzymes that are going to do the cutting are called RAG1 and RAG2. The, um, And RAG1 and RAG2, as you can see here, are going to bind to the RSS. Here we've got heptamer 12 nonamer. So that's this whole business is one triangle. Here we've got heptamer 23 nonamer. This whole business is another triangle. And you can see RAG1 and RAG2 are actually binding, particularly RAG1 is binding um, to this area and kind of bringing it together. So RAG1 has chosen V1 and J1 and brought them together so that we can do VDJ recombination. And eventually, that V1 and J1 are going to be put together. And all of this DNA that was in between, including those um, RSSs, including our little triangles, is eventually going to get thrown out. Um, and so you can see this happening here as well. So RAG1 and RAG2 are going to recognize the RSS. You can see my RSS is here. And they're going to nick the DNA. This process is happening twice. So you can see it's happening at the V and it's happening at the J. They are actually held together really closely by RAG1. And so we're going to get a nick right here between the V and its RSS and a nick right here between the J and its RSS. If I, if we, the textbook, I, I can't draw anything. The textbook kept drawing both of these the whole way through. It would become a big giant mess really quickly. So here you can see they're both bound by this blue blob that is the RAG complex. And then we're just going to be seeing some of the events that are happening at one side. And that's for simplicity's sake in terms of us looking at this. It is not because only one side is doing it. It's because it would just be way too hard to look at if we tried to look at both sides right now. So what you'll see is that RAG uh, will make a DNA nick. And a DNA nick is a specific kind uh, of event. So what a DNA nick means is that a DNA nick is a single stranded cut of the DNA. So what you can see is that one strand gets cut and the other one doesn't. So that's what it, it means that it, it makes a nick is that we get this single strand cut. One strand is cut, one strand is not cut. So
so now, after we've had our DNA nick, here is the DNA before, because I'm good at drawing. Got double strand DNA, five prime, three prime end, right? We're going to make a nick, right? Now here is a new three prime end, here is a new five prime end, and there's a hole in the middle. These little five primes, they have OHs, the hydroxyls, the three prime hydroxyl. These five primes, they have five prime phosphates. So that's, when we say three prime and five prime, that's what we mean, is that there's a free phosphate or a free hydroxyl. And now I made this little break and I've got a new, I've got these new free stuffs, free chemistries. That hydroxyl does not like to be free. That hydroxyl is not too happy about being free. And so that hydroxyl performs a nucleophilic attack because it doesn't want to be free. It wants to be paired with something. And the thing that it makes, it, it attacks, is the opposite strand. So that free hydroxyl attacks the other piece of DNA. So we can see that eventually this piece of DNA, which was our mini gene, like our V, gets basically re reattached to itself. The top strand gets attached to the bottom strand because the top strand's hydroxyl has attacked the bottom strand's phosphate. And the other stuff just gets thrown away. So you can see we get this little hairpin formed. Can you see how we got the hairpin from this nucleophilic attack? And then the other DNA is just like sad. And that other DNA was my little triangle. So now we've got two pieces of DNA. We've got this piece of DNA that is my mini gene that I want to do important things with. Um, it's eventually going to code for the antibody. So I call it the coding end. I also have this other piece that was the RSS. So I call it the signal end. So now I got to do something with my coding end, and I got to do something with my signal end. And if we were really drawing this whole thing, we'd have two coding ends and two signal ends, one for like the V and one for the J. But that would just be way too much to look at here. So that's why we're only showing you one coding end, one signal end. But really, there's two coding ends, two signal ends. So now, we're, first, we're going to talk about what happens to the signal end, the two signal ends that we have. And the reason why we're going to talk about what happens to the two signal ends first is because it's easier. So here you can see we've got two hairpins. We've got two signal ends, right? Um, we take those two signal ends. You can also see here's my two signal, here's my signal ends. Here I've got two signal ends <laughs> as well. We've got lots of different views of this. I take my two signal ends and I stick them together with my ligase and I never see them ever again. <laughs> we're done with them. So that, so we're gonna make this nice little circle of DNA where we stuck together our signal ends. You can see that the right where we get the stuff stuck together is those triangles. We get this little circle of DNA. Here's my little circle of DNA here. Here's where I've stuck together my two triangles. And I have all of the intervening DNA. And I'm going to throw that out, and no one ever cares about it ever again. And we're never going to see it ever again. So signal join, easy. <laughs> Coding join, more complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it hangs out in the cell. And as the cell undergoes divisions, it's 
basically gets lost um, because it doesn't have an origin of replication to get replicated. So basically, there's just the one piece of DNA from like the parental cell. And as the cell divides, it doesn't replicate. It just, does, it just sits there. And eventually, it'll just get degraded as random stuff in the cell, like random trash. But the coding end is more complicated. And the reason why, and part of the complication in the coding end is because when we deal with the coding end, we're also going to be getting that junctional diversity I told you about. So we've got to have some additional stuff happening with the coding end to potentially add or subtract base pairs. And that's the thing that's going to give us those sprinkles on the top of the VDJ diversity that I told you about. So as we deal with this coding end, really what we're doing is we're getting our junctional diversity added in. So previously on immunology, previously on VDJ recombination, we had a coding end. The coding end, you can see here. The coding end is this wacky DNA structure. The top strand is now attached to the bottom strand. And then we have this little hairpin attaching them. Um, so when I learned this as an undergraduate, I was taught, and then the hairpin opens by magic. Um, and some of the sort of details of what happened with the hairpin opening. Um, when I was in graduate school, we actually, or someone, I did not, uh, discovered the enzyme that opens the hairpin. Um, if you can't do, if you can't open your hairpin, you can't ever finish VDJ recombination. You make no B cells and T cells. You end up very sick. You end up dying of immunodeficiency, generally as a child. So the person who discovered this enzyme named it after a Greek goddess. And specifically, they chose the Greek goddess who is the protector of women and children. Because this enzyme protects children from immunodeficiency. Um, so the name of this enzyme is Artemis. So we're going to have our enzyme Artemis that's going to open this hairpin. Artemis is an amazing enzyme. It got named after a Greek goddess. It's such a great enzyme. But Artemis has a little bit of a problem as well. It's not a perfect enzyme. I don't think there is such a thing as a perfect enzyme, but that's OK. So Artemis is going to come to this hairpin and break it. But I'm going to redraw my hairpin for you in a slightly different way. So here is my DNA before RAG1 came along. I got a nick. <laughs> now I have my free OH. This OH is going to attack that P, that phosphate. I'm going to have a bond right there. Okay? And it's a bond between a phosphate and a hydroxyl. 
There's also a, bo a similar bond right there, and 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 right there, right there, right there, right there, right there. So you can see all sorts of bonds that are basically chemically the same bond. Artemis has a problem. Artemis is going to cut open this hairpin. It's going to cut a hydroxyl phosphate bond. Artemis does not know which is the bond. Artemis can't tell the difference between this bond and this bond and this bond and this bond and this bond. Um, Artemis is hanging out in this location, and it's going to cut a bond. But sometimes it doesn't cut this original bond. Sometimes it cuts too far up here on this strand. Sometimes it cuts too far on this strand. Um, it can actually cut up to five base pairs away in either direction. So there's sort of this 10 base pair range where it can cut. And so you can see on this slide, well, sometimes it cuts at position two. And we end up with kind of the original perfect thing that we had. And everything ends up looking great. Sometimes it cuts at position three. And when that happens, this bottom strand gets some extra base pairs. And the top strand has, a, has some fewer. Sometimes it cuts at position one. And we get the top strand has some fewer extra base pairs. The bottom strand doesn't. And so you can also see this um, again at the bottom. Um, in with actual base pair like letter <laughs> so here this the actual sequence ends TC we could cut right there and have the sequence at the top end TC but if we cut here instead now we get TCGA um, here you can see we got some extra sequence down here because uh, of how we've cut um, so it's not a perfectly symmetrical cut. And before we can actually stick those base pairs back together, the DNA repair enzymes are going to fill in that overhang. And so you can see the overhang having been filled in here um, before we can actually do our ligation. So you can see this here as well um, from your textbook. Here you can see the cuts um, right by the heptamer. You can see our little hairpin. <laughs> and you can see in this case, we opened um, two base pairs too far this way, and we got this two extra base pairs. We got opened two base pairs too far this way on the J. We got these two extra base pairs. Um, and so let's look at sort of specifically what is going to happen here. Oh, there's even colored chalk over here. This is exciting. So I have my D region. That didn't break at all. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and my D region like ends up with a T, C, and then there was A, G, right? So there's my hairpin on the D region. And here's my hairpin on the J. Okay, I'm I'm just redrawing what's up there. <laughs> um, and I'm going to cut here, and I'm going to cut here. So I'm going to get D. That's going to go end up with T C G A. And then this strand is going to be empty. And I'm going to get this one. It's going to go T A, T A, and this strand is going to be empty. OK? So you see, I, I'm really just redrawing exactly what they've got up there. My, and so if I actually change my colors for a second, if you look, this T and this C were originally encoded in the DNA. If you look at the DNA at that sequence in a non-immune cell, there's TC there. But this GA, that's new sequence we've added out of nowhere. 
it's not really out of nowhere, it was connected. But if you actually compared the sequence in this B cell um, with the, geno the germline genetic sequence, we now have added base pairs that were not there before. And when we actually go in, and um, complement, it, we're going to get fully added in base pairs that are not, were not in the original. So do you see how we've gotten this added in base pair, the ones in blue, that are not in the original sequence? That's one of the ways we get junctional diversity. Are the, this is the adding and subtracting. Here we've added. If you look at those, ba those letters, if you look at this one, it goes T, C, G, A. And if you read the other strand, it goes T, C, G, A. It reads the same forward and backwards. In English, you call a word that reads the same forward and backwards a palindrome. And so these nucleotides are called palindromic nucleotides, or p-nucleotides. Um, they are coming from um, asymmetric hairpin opening. On Friday, I'm going to continue talking about VDJ recombination. Um, I had a feeling this was going to happen. And I may even go over some problems that look somewhat like some problems that you see on the problem set, because there's a problem set due after break.